So we think that the opposite of hope is hopelessness, uh, but actually its partner opposite is the emotion of fear. And this is part of the du the dualism of life, yin and yang. They're different, but they're inseparable. And so I've written about this many times because there is a way out of that trap. First of all, don't get suckered in by needing to be hopeful. Just mm -hmm. do what seems to be important to do in the moment. Now, you can't decide what's important to do until you clear your vision, until you don't look out through the filters of hope or the filters of fear or the filters of, well, I know what is meaningful work to me. No, you've got to clear all of that. And then when you look around and ask, the fundamental shift to ask, not what do I think I can accomplish if I'm so hopeful because I, I have a lot of energy given to me by hope. No, you'll have a lot of energy taken away from you by fear. But the question becomes, to be able to see clearly where you are, whatever your sphere of influence, and ask, what's needed here? Yes. What's the situation need? What's the other person need? What's the cause need? And the second question, am I the one to serve that need right now? Meg, I have looked forward to this for so long because, as you know, uh, because I've shared with you that uh, of the almost 90 post-Doom conversations that I've had over the last three years, um, the two of my absolute favorites are with you. And it wasn't a conversation I had with you. It was <laughs> right. the late Terry Patton and then Michael Shaw. And so what a treat that we've had conversations, but they weren't yeah. recorded as post-Doom conversations. Everything you bring to the world, I just love and admire and respect and have held you as an older sister on the path for decades. And um, I'm just delighted to be in this post-doom, no gloom, heart space and head space, this Wonderful. warrior for the yes. human spirit. So, and all right, if you could just take a moment just at the beginning and just in case people, anybody listening to this or watching this, they don't know who you yeah. are, Margaret Wheatley. Yeah, I've heard of her, but I don't know, you know, right. share a little bit about, you know, <laughs> Well, I love looking back now and trying to summarize myself. Um, I've been out working in the world since 1966, lived in several different cultures. My work is distinctly global, but it has been focused on really introducing us to a new paradigm, a new way of being. According, my field is leadership, my field is organizational behavior, but there, if we could learn from life, how life self-organizes, how life establishes order out of chaos without direction, but with clear, a clear coherent center. This has been my life's work and I've been a consultant, I've been a formal leader, I've been an advisor to very senior people. And I most recently used my ability to call people together, given what's happening, given where we are headed. My most recent work is studying a pattern of collapse in civilizations, which is so well established. It's so clear where we are on the pattern of collapse. Exactly. And I wanted those willing few who had power, influence, or deep concern. So citizens, activists, and leaders, I wanted them to take on a new role as warriors for the human spirit, people who are dedicated to serving people. And, and then we added, it's the spirit of life as well. But with the clear certainty that we're not pulling out of this. We're not reversing anything. And we have to be prepared to be the presence of insight and compassion for the increased suffering that is already happening, but is definitely escalating. I mean, I heard one um, uh, climate scientist in the Arctic who in his most recent report, he said, well, everything was always happening at exponential speed. He said, but now the exponents have exponentiated. 
<laughs> okay, Isn't that good? Yes. yes. And so I'm preparing several hundred people from three dozen countries so far to really be prepared to be of service, to give up their own demands and power grabs and just want to serve people as we go through greater and greater suffering. Yes, yes. How did you make the shift? Like, when did you go from whatever worldview you had in the, say, the 1970s, 80s yeah. into the 90s? And then how did that shift uh, around climate, abrupt climate, collapse, all that kind of stuff? Like, how did that, a little bit of your story of how you yeah. went from that to now? Well, the easy answer is when I realized the paralysis and imprisonment we face from our paradigm of control, of, of domination, of using the earth as resources rather than participating with life. And my first experience of the wondrousness of life was through the science of living systems. Yeah. And I remember the moment when I realized you did not have to control things to get order. I mean, yes. I remember that as a vivid monumental moment for me, a true epiphany. When I became concerned with climate, so that I'm talking about 1991 when I was writing leadership in the new science, mm -hmm. but my concern about the environment started in the 90s, but I still felt we could save ourselves yeah. um, and that it just requires shift in leadership right. and that kind of fundamental paradigm shift and then I think I only tuned into near-term extinction just a few years ago I tuned into arctic ice in particular and because I have a strong science background I could understand it and I began communicating it as part of First, I was focused on the end of uh, civilizations and where we are, but then it became the, you know, all civilizations at their last stage are completely distracted by internal politics, infighting, and they don't recognize the enemy at the gate. Yes. In 2012, I thought the enemy was terrorists, you know, people who were just going to destroy democracy. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, no, it's climate. It's mm -hmm. climate. Mm -hmm. And that still is my uh, perspective, except for what we may be facing with Putin now. But certainly climate is is the great en enemy. And, and then when people started getting so excited about hope, <laughs> like we're going to turn this around. And one of my dear colleagues was saying, you know, the only problem we face is people who do not believe we can make, we can stop this now, we can turn it around. And so, you know, my work now with warriors, we need to prepare for catastrophic losses and suffering from, from natural forces, yes. as well as the political forces. <laughs> yeah. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I find that when I'm speaking pretty much across the board, but certainly with progressives and liberals and environmentalists and peace, people involved in this sort of the, the fight for justice of various kinds and, and, and scale. Um, most of them, it seems to me, really don't get that our fundamental issue isn't climate, it's ecological overshoot. Yes, um, and that is so important. That That is such a great contribution, Michael, yeah. It's not climate, it's overshoot. I had to drive, we had to drive, this is back when Connie and I were still living our itinerant uh, lifestyle, traveling North America and speaking in all different kinds of secular and religious settings. And so we listened to your book uh, along the way. And I, A, I was so delighted that it was, that you recorded the audio in your own voice, but also that you integrated some of the people that I find so helpful and inspiring. Uh, William Ophels, for example, and uh, Sir John Glubb, and uh, the bringing in a both an ecological and a historical understanding. And I'm wondering if you could just say a little bit about how that ecological and historical perspective 
have informed your sense now uh, of reality and what's unfolding and what's unstoppable? Well, I have a natural ecological sensitivity because I am a student of living system science and I've been studying living systems now for 30 plus years. So it, it doesn't even appear as this category of, oh, you switch to ecological <laughs> thinking is no this is how life works right. and i've i've used the dynamics of life of self organization and of complexity and chaos theory and even quantum theory i've used those to bring hope leaders to a new sensitivity so for that was for me um it's like, what are you talking about? Of course, this is how life works. Okay. But the historical perspective, I've just realized that my first paper that I wrote in college was looking at <laughs> collapse through Arnold Toynbee and Otto oh, yes. Bangler. Yes, so yes. when I was 18 years old, somehow I was intrigued by that. And, uh, and I, I am, a, you know, I have a strong background in history. I was a history major as an undergrad. But uh, when I started reading um, uh, Joseph Tainter, someone referred me to him many years ago. And it was just like, oh, <laughs> I see this. And then Glove's work just lit up my world because the six stages that he describes make so much sense to me as a student of human behavior and as a student of, of societies, which has been my work. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it just became, yeah, I, we could tick off the boxes of these behaviors that are now showing up with us, um, especially celebrity culture at the very end where people worship sports stars Yes, celebrities, yes. Um, musicians, and actors. Yes. <laughs> and we're here. And then, you know, adding climate to it was was the the newer piece. And, and and what I've just written about in a total revision of who do we choose to be that will come out in June. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, well, I'm thrilled to hear that. I mean, I it was interesting. I had reread your book I don't know, about two years ago and i thought well there's just not a lot that's outdated um at all and so i am uh, particularly interested in in uh, seeing your yeah. uh your it is seriously updated so much so that i wanted to put a trigger warning on the cover <laughs> <laughs> saying, saying this book has been updated with terrifying information that will hopefully inspire you to uh, become a warrior for the human spirit but it's quite terrifying what's happening on all dimensions well okay so i'm thrilled that you <laughs> said it exactly that way because what i'd love to lean in with you i mean i certainly want to address one of the things we've both been doing work in recently is hope is usually perceived as a good thing uh you yes. know you gotta have hope and and people are you know and People always want to stay hopeful. And um, and yet I, as I know you do, often see hope as actually um, uh, a curse. Um, so, but before we go there, what I'd love to do is to um, to invite you to, to share what is it about accepting collapse, accepting abrupt uh, climate mayhem, accepting not just the possibility, but the probability, well, the inevitability, uh, the inevitability, of, of, the inevitability of near term human extinction of Homo Colossus, and the very likely that that will also mean the extinction of Homo sapiens. And even if it's not 100% of us, it's 99% of us and 98. What is it about the acceptance of all that, which yeah. is repulsive and unacceptable to right. most humans? What opens up for you? What did open up for you? Yeah. And what do you what do you encourage can open up for others in that place of acceptance? Uh, you know, yeah, the benefits is, of collapse acceptance. This is what I've loved about your work and where you're leading all of us or creating the resources for all of us. Because the first 
place we all go is just almost suicidal depression. Like, I don't want to be here any longer. And we have that experience with several environmentalists and activists who see what's coming and just check out. And in some ways, our level of grief and despair, I think, is how we've been conditioned in Western culture, which is now global culture. Like we think, and I often, I mean, the way I position my own self and my own despair, and this sounds somewhat grandiose, but it's actually based on actual experience with these people. Uh, sometimes I put myself in Mandela's cell on Robben Island, where I have been many times. And I just tune into, so what did it feel like for you? Mm. And um, I do that with the Dalai Lama. I do that with one of my teachers, Chogim Trungpa, who um, the other day when I was in really absolute despair at what's going on in America, this is before England took the lead in the race toward collapse. Um, but I was in such appalling despair because I could just see we've lost America. And where I put myself in my mind was in the experience of the great Tibetan teachers, including the Dalai Lama and including Chögyam Trungpa, when they were told the Chinese have invaded they are burning the monasteries. They are killing the monks. They are raping the nuns. And both the Dalai Lama and many teachers said, okay, we have to leave. But when do we have to leave? And we're not leaving for self-protection. We're leaving because we have to protect these teachings. Yes, exactly. And I know the experience of Chogyam Trungpa inside out because I've been part of Shambhala um, and, and the Dalai Lama I've listened to many times about this. So the reason I, I find these ec extreme role models for me is to put this in perspective. Mm -hmm. Other people have suffered greatly I mean, I often think about, you know, when all the lights were going out at the beginning of World War II, and some sage said, you know, the lights are going out all over Europe, and I doubt that we will see them on again in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I have wanted to locate myself in the history of severe oppression because there still is the human spirit mm -hmm. <laughs> that is mm -hmm. so evident. There still is the possibility to triumph, not at this level, but at a deeply spiritual level with our, our great human spirits. And mm -hmm. that's the basis of my work now. So, um, you know, one of the things we are also <laughs> encountering, and it's why hope and hopium have moved front and center, is we still want our lives to be good and meaningful in the old terms, right? Mm -hmm. Success, comfort, safety, profit, money, whatever. I have that still in my, you know, children now who are married with children. Mm -hmm. They're still looking for believing in the possibility of a very good life going mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. Um so we are not only grief stricken, we are profoundly disappointed. We're not getting the life we were told we could have. Yes. Okay. And then us good people who still want to make a difference, we, we get so engaged in needing to be hopeful as the way to make a difference, but we don't realize that the difference has changed yes. you know we can make a difference but it's far less grand it's not at the global level any longer it's in our communities it's preparing our communities it's preparing ourselves to be strong presences for other people when everyone else is succumbing to animalistic human animalistic survival 
instinctive behavior, we can be better than that. But what a change, right? I mean, what a shift from thinking, I, I know the terms of success for me, I have a great life, I have comfort, safety, et cetera, and now I'm being asked to just be a compassionate, insightful presence for people. Yeah, yeah. And what yeah. wonderful shift that is when you actually realize it. Yes, yes. Well, say a little bit more about your warrior training. Uh, for anybody who might be curious about sort of stepping into being a warrior for the human spirit um, and not just accepting collapse, accepting the probability of near-term human extinction or the inevitability of near-term human extinction of Homo colossus, not just accepting that, but 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 choosing to be in action in a meaningful, service-oriented, compassionate, generous way. To say say about your talk about your 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 training. Well, basically, it means, and I would refer people to my website where things are outlined, and we have a new resource that's quite fascinating because it's voice and sound together, a journey into warrior training. Um, it begins with the desire to serve, okay? To find meaningful work. We're, that's what all the hopium addicts are looking for. They are still trying to make a difference. So it starts with acknowledging, yes, I have this inherent motivation. I want to contribute, but then we have to redefine what is meaningful contribution. And once, and the way to see clearly, I mean, I use this slogan now all the time that we want to see clearly so we can act wisely. Mm -hmm. So we don't go chasing after windmills like Don Quixote, the windmills of thinking we're going to turn this around or slow it down. And it is, is climate catastrophe. It's actually the planet being lawful <laughs> and yes. you and i will talk about that in a moment but for warrior training there has to be a realization that i still want to make a difference and it's not working the old ways you know my work is failing or it's succeeding and then it gets wiped uh, you know wiped aside by politics or resources taken away or people discounting it or I just get exhausted and tired and demoralized. Mm -hmm. So we have to be in this place of still wanting to contribute and realizing that has to change. There have to be new ways. And it's the new way is about preparing oneself to serve well or wisely. Now to do that, you have to get rid of all your ego clutter. You have to get rid of your needs and demands. So we teach meditation. I mean, it's the core practice of being able to watch yourself and watch your mind. We teach having a stable mind so you don't get so triggered. So you're not this emotional reactor, but instead you learn to pause and try and see what the other person needs or what is needed here. So it's creating a stable, clear and open in mind and these are very traditional practices from many spiritual traditions but it's a surrender of the self ultimately yeah. and some of the surrender is just clearing the mind of ego clutter but the other surrender is very deeply spiritual of i'm available i'm here i want to serve show me whatever yeah. your faith is show me yeah. But yeah, I use yeah. this phrase a lot with warriors now. Just keep saying, I'm available. Yep. And then see what comes to you. Yep. And we also really spend time on mind body awareness. So we become more uh, familiar with how we are and become deeply practiced with what presence feels like. So, we, you know, I. There's many ways to talk about this, but it's deeply spiritual and it's yep. grounding because 
that's how humans get through anything by being together we have a great community but being together with a shared view and a deep spiritual practice that's how humans get through anything yeah let's lean into hope and hopium and you know as you have been yeah. thinking about you know the hard problem of of hope but uh, let's lean into that because I think that there's not yeah. enough conversation, in my opinion, on that topic because many people think of hope as a positive thing. And yet yeah. when you, e even just looking at Pandora's box, it was actually a curse, you know? That's right. Well, um, I've written about this quite a lot, I think for the past 20 years, because one of the things that you learn when you're, and I'm a Buddhist practitioner, also now with an Indian mystic. But the great thing you want to overcome to clear your vision and to free yourself from pain and suffering is this duality that is not separable between hope and fear. So what you hope for always when you when you get hopeful as your solution to your pain and grief you just get more and more hopeful you're going to be more and more fearful when it fails so hope is a blinder it's also known you're talking about it michael as a curse and in some old ancient texts it's called the ambush of hope because yeah. once you're taken over by hope you're enticed by the possibility of creating global change or you're enticed by the possibility of creating something really rich and positive at this time once you're there you're in the trap and when things start to fall apart the net just descends on you. If you've ever seen those nets in a, in a physical ambush pit and you're ensnared by fear. So we think that the opposite of hope is hopelessness, uh, but actually its partner opposite is the emotion of fear. And this is part of the, du the dualism of life, yin and yang. They're different but they're inseparable. And so I've written about this many times because there is a way out of that trap. First of all, don't get suckered in by needing to be hopeful. Just mm -hmm. do what seems to be important to do in the moment. Now you can't decide what's important to do until you clear your vision, until you don't look out through the filters of hope or the filters of fear or the filters of well i know what is meaningful work to me no you've got to clear all of that and then when you look around and ask this is a fundamental shift to ask not what do i will think i can accomplish if i'm so hopeful because i i have a lot of energy given to me by hope no you'll have a lot of energy taken away from you by fear but the question becomes to be able to see clearly where you are, whatever your sphere of influence, and ask, what's needed here? Yes. What's the situation need? What's the other person need? What's the cause need? And the second question, am I the one to serve that need right now? Right. You know, um, it's a powerful shift in focus. And it's the true... Um, activation of energy and motivation because you're doing something meaningful that you didn't define yeah. and you're in the moment when you have to be in the moment and you have to have clear perception i agree and yet the vast majority of people in my experience are afraid that without hope they won't be motivated to do anything. absolutely they'll be hopeless worthless depressed people yeah yes. so say something about the hope-free motivation hope-free motivation is finding your place here 
where you are needed, where you can be useful. Mm -hmm. And that is created external to oneself. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to be willing to have an open heart, not be afraid, as Joanna Macy said, not being afraid of the pain of the world. Mm -hmm. Compassion, when we look out at this world, I mean, we're met with such despair and suffering and just outright degradation of the human spirit and people and planet. But the other side of compassion is it leads you into a relationship that is inherently meaningful. And that relationship combined with being able to see clearly and discern, have clear seeing, then you find all sorts of meaningful work to do. And it may just be a singular conversation with a person who needed that, or, or it could be with a child or an adult child, mm -hmm. but it could also be seeing clearly what your community needs and where you can organize a project, where you can organize something that will create um, mitigation of suffering or prevention of disaster. Um, but you have to be willing to look with both an open heart and also clear discernment. You can't have one without the other. And that's, you know, those are the skills of compassion and insight, which are the place beyond hope and fear. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Well, Meg, one of the things I'd like to uh, just have a conversation with you about related to what we're just now on is this whole notion of hopium that is hope as a means of soothing pain or or comforting us in difficult times and yet we can be so easily addicted to that um as as you know and actually created a really delightful little meme a little uh, little image with the my own sense of hopium uh is that hopium is a comforting vision of the future that requires breaking the laws of physics, biology, right. <laughs> and ecology. Uh, irrational or unwarranted optimism that promises short-term relief, but delivers crushing disappointment and despair when reality inevitably bites. And bless you for that definition. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, so say something about that addictive nature of hopium, and then how do you engage with people on this issue? Yeah, well... Uh, the addictive nature, for me, there's clear cause and effect. We feel the pain of the world. We feel despair. We can't bear that feeling. And like all addicts, at the beginning, we're just trying something to see if it relieves our pain. And then it does have what you just read in that definition, short-term relief, like I'm doing something that feels really good to me. And I'm working with other people who are optimistic and forget all those doom sphere folks, you know, uh, they're just bad to hang out with. And then because you cannot be hopeful without fear coming right in, it just flips when that project fails, when uh, everything goes, goes to rot, um suddenly you're you're feeling not only hopeless you're feeling more acute fear and more acute despair and then what we do because it is a drug and we're unaware of hope and fear as partners we pump ourselves up even more and go back to work with ever more hopefulness <laughs> which leads to ever more despair that's the cycle that needs to be broken. And it needs to be broken first by recognizing that hope is hopium. It's a drug and we have to break the addiction. Now, the way you break an addiction is to find an alternative that is healthy. And that's where I develop warrior training. That's where I think doesn't matter whether you're in training, but can you just find work that's useful? <laughs> Forget your big dreams, forget your big ego-based dreams and realize there's deep satisfaction from doing local work that is useful and that is the use utility is defined by the situation. 
So we do have to get over ourselves here. We have to get over this, this image of I'm someone who can make a difference. Um, and therefore, I have to be hopeful. No, you have to see clearly what's needed, period. And yeah, then you right. discover true meaning in life. The meaning of life is being in good relationships, doing work that does help in the moment, that does serve um, for the short term, for the immediate moment. We've just gotten so lost in this culture by thinking that we'll make things better, we'll save the world. I'm really trying to discover when that phraseology appeared first that, you know, we have to save the world. It was my intention to save the world for many years. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where it, when it started in this culture, oh. but big dreams, big vision. Yes, we had those. It's no longer relevant. It's no yeah. longer relevant. Yeah. So we have to come out, we have to come down from hopium. It's a false high, and then it's a real crash and burn. But we don't have to stay in the crash and burn. We can just look around and find many, many opportunities for meaningful work. And that's the true antidote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I so valued um when connie and i originally listened because it was just audio it was a terry Patton's podcast state of emergence podcast with you and it was like you know an hour and a half uh and we listened to it and i was so both of us were so grateful for your being willing to and and terry's amazing ability to receive it in a humble uh, yeah. uh in a humble way but it seems to me that there are those who are sort of hitting the hopium pipe on the religious side and then those on the secular. And those on the religion side are often it's about a transformation of consciousness and, and some large scale global uh, uh, transition or transformation. Uh, and and uh. you dealt with that in such a warrior fashion. You were you were straight, you were a ruthless, but also compassionate. Uh, yeah. So I, I want to, anybody listening to this or watching this conversation, please do take the time to watch Meg's conversation uh, with Terry on that, because I just thought it was brilliant. But then on the secular side, so many people have, and this actually bleeds into the religious side too, this sense, this, it's not even faith, it's like belief in the almighty we that yes. we can transform things that if we come together and and vote the right people or make the right shifts or adopt the right technologies or whatever this sense of the almighty we and I, i'm just wondering if you could share a little bit about yes. sort of that yeah and i love that phrase that apparently connie introduced um it's the almighty we combined with our techno magic culture. Yes. Right? Uh, we are true masters of the universe. And through our incredible brilliance and technology, we're going to remove plastic from the ocean. We're going to, um, you know, reclaim soil. We're going to do anything because we are techno geniuses, right? right? That's part of it. But then the almighty we also is based on, as your first part of the definition of hoping, a complete ignorance or outright denial of how the planet works. Yes. Yes. So it's saying, it's, you know, you and I have talked a lot about anthropocentrism this for me feels like deification of human willpower yeah that if humans get together we are and now i can quote brochures we are invincible we are unstoppable those are direct quotes from a brochure on hope whose brochure on hope it, it was an event on hope that uh oh. was just about a year ago right okay i remember that yes okay yes so it's this deification of humans as gods, really. I don't know any other way to place it to it's that extreme. And it's also 
uh, we're we're super creatures you know <laughs> maybe we've believed all the movies that are young children are getting fed about superheroes right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um we're completely ignoring how the planet works yes. i find this at one level outrageous totally disrespectful the source of loneliness the sense the source of feeling abandoned of feeling victimized all these things are because we have been brought up in a culture that really reinforces our superheroedness and in fact we are participants in an incredible planet and she is working out her laws she has never changed her laws but she also has never changed the sense of order you know, there's natural law and there's natural order. And by violating natural law, we've lost touch with the fact that this is an orderly planet. It doesn't work to mean everything gets better and better or everything that, you know, this confusion that evolution means progress. It doesn't. It just means adapt, adapting well to circumstances. Exactly. Um so I think the profound loneliness of our culture is because we have also lost touch with we are we are welcomed on the planet as participants, but not as kings or dominatrix or whatever. Yeah. Um, and all of this gets mixed up as we're trying to create positive change at a time when that is simply not possible. At the level of scale, of it scale. needed to change. Exactly. It's just, but it, but this, I mean, I'd love to hear your views as a theologian and eco priest um, about this, the, what I just labeled as loneliness because we're separated from the planet. Wow, thank you for the question, because I'd love to share her yeah. <laughs> um, uh, on that topic, because I think the language, I mean, as I think you know, several of my programs, I've, I've included a quote from uh, Joseph Brodsky, who won the Nobel Prize in Literature back in 1987, where he says, you know, you Americans are so naive, you think evil is going to come stomping onto your you know porch with big black boots and knocking the door down he says no it doesn't happen like that look at the language it starts in the yeah. language and to my mind the because language is we, our fundamental addiction as far as i can tell that our name for primary reality our name for our biophysical creator sustainer and end if our name or names for that reality, which is undeniable, it's the biosphere, it's the universe, it's 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 our living creator, sustainer, and end. But if our name for that evokes hubris rather than humility, which the environment tends to do, which nature with little n tends to do, then we delude ourselves into thinking, well, the, first of all, we experience the loneliness that you were just talking about because we are alienated from our fundamental living creator, sustainer, and end. And so whether you're a theist and think of God as a supernatural being outside the universe, or you're an atheist and you completely you know, discard that, that notion as superstition, you're both left with a biosphere and a cosmos that is merely an it to be exploited right. rather than a thou to be honored and related to in a respectful way and so that's one of the things that i love about robin wall kimmer and oh, her yes. braving sweetgrass and that it's oh, not yeah. just about loving earth but actually realizing that this is a reciprocal reality that we live in and to the degree that i act as if the universe loves me that nature loves me that there's this reciprocity, this relationship, then I find that I am not only not lonely, but I am profoundly held by the community of life as kin, that the other species, as Daniel Wildcat says, we're surrounded by relatives, not resources. Yes. 
And that sense of relatedness that only comes when we realize that we are in a participatory universe. And so that's why I've started spelling, as you know, God, G, Earth, emoji, D. Right. Because <laughs> any concept of the divine that doesn't include our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end is, is not just inadequate, but I see really as ecocidal. This almighty we, this hubris that we think that man, conqueror of nature, like that that's our destiny. And we do that through technology, through progress. And so the very things that are bringing about ecocide, things like progress and development, things like uh, the technology that's all about controlling nature, science that's about understanding, but where that science isn't in service of, okay, it's one thing to understand reality, but we also need to relate to reality in a healthy way, in a mutually enhancing way, as Thomas Berry used to say. And so the very, and growth economics, I mean, you know, civilization yeah. itself, science and technology, progress and development and growth economics are the four, what I call the four fundamental drivers, causes and drivers of ecocide. And yet almost all of the techno fixes and the people that believe that we can solve the climate crisis and that we can, and who don't recognize overshoot is the biggest issue, almost always propose so-called solutions and fixes that simply rely more and more on the very things causing ecocide in the first place. So that's why much of my message now is about, to use religious to use traditional religious language that most people go, what the hell is he talking about? To repent, that is to be willing to publicly and privately say, I was wrong. We were wrong. We thought that greater control over nature was our way into the future. No, we were wrong about that. So to repent and then to fall back in love with God, that is our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end, and then find ways to be a generous, compassionate, loving service in the real end times in which we're in so that's amen yes. aho i think we so underestimate the comfort and sustenance we can find when we feel held by nature aho. right Absolutely. and um you open to the grief i mean there is a place here i live in utah severe drought the potential death of the Great Salt Lake, which will be catastrophic. And then with drought, you get pine bark beetle. And there is a high mountain place that I've gone to many times at 10,000 feet, not that far from where I live in the mountains. Last time I was there, all I could see was dead trees. And I thought, well, this is not going to be my place of rest or respite or, or uh, I, I'm just with the grief of this loss of, you know, in, in the West, we've lost tens of millions of trees to pine bark beetle. But then I come down to another place where life is still vibrant and I just sit there. Yes. And then I feel held. I feel I belong here and we need to rely on this um it's i don't i can't fix anything i can't stop pine bark beetles too late but i can be in places where i just just know that i am truly held um by by the uh great company of all beings i mean it's a very indigenous worldview it's a very yeah. mystical worldview and i don't think enough of us trust that that is available i mean we go out in nature and we may just feel more peaceful <laughs> i've written about the irony of how we go out in nature to feel peaceful so we can go back to our work settings where we're actually <laughs> you know, engaged in continuing destructive work. We don't have a choice with that. But for, I just want people to consciously now go out, be with life, what we call nature, and um, just open to, to what Thich Nhat Hanh so beautifully described as interbeing. Yes. 
and and rely on that rely on that you know there's so much publicity now as one of the antidotes to stress is to get outside to go in nature yes but there's a whole other level of comfort consolation love support that you can feel yeah. and i just want to stress that these practices give us the ability to do our work yes because it's very hard to hold these scenarios of what's happening and what's to come. It's impossible, I would say. And, you know, so we talked about the loneliness. I remember reading of a quantum physicist who said that we constructed an image of the universe, and he was speaking the universe, um, that has nothing human in it. So we created this disconnect. We created our loneliness. Yeah. And um, it truly is the support, the strength, the constellation, and the inspiration to keep doing what is very difficult work, very difficult. I mean, I have mornings when I realize, okay, I'm just going to be in despair for a while. I'm not afraid of it any longer because I know I will come out of it. I'm not plummeting for for a long period of time. I'll I'll spend a whole morning just allowing the despair. And then it instantly vanishes if somebody calls me or someone sends me an email or there's something, there's some way I can extend myself to another person. Then I'm I'm right here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that because uh, so oftentimes people think that those of us that have been uh, yeah. in this work for some time are sort of beyond grief or beyond despair or beyond, uh, you know, sadness or anger or anything like that. Yeah. And uh, I, I must say that living in this place of not just collapse acceptance, but collapse trust, understanding of the historical and ecological nature of overshoot and collapse and understanding abrupt climate change and the tipping points that are already out of our control those do help me that when when i'm i'm five years ago the news often stuck me like a dagger and twist you know it's like oh, oh you know and it rarely that rarely occurs anymore i i'm more likely to reach for the popcorn than i am to pull my hair out um and part of that is being in collapsed trust but part of that is also having had the time to grieve and to grieve and being in communication and communion and relationship with others such as yourself who are inviting people to step into their own warrior spirit for for life for the uh right. the that's right yeah so yeah. meg anything that you'd like to say to bring this conversation to completion and then how do people find out more about your yeah. own work? Well, just go to margaretwheatley.com. It's filled with resources. My current thinking is a separate tab. Warrior training is a separate tab. But in another um, few minutes, I'm going to go sit with one of my dearest friends who is dying. And uh, you've spoken about this with someone, I can't remember who, but it's once we accept dying as a fact, then our love just pours out of us. And all we want to do is provide comfort and friendship and companionship to the one who is dying. Yes, yes. And for me, this is not... In, in a metaphor this is literal how am i with the planet how am i with all those millions of dead trees how am i with everything i just want to love it more yes yeah yes amen well one of the things that i want to make sure that i mention is that not only is there a lot of great stuff on margaretwheatley.com but your song line in particular yeah. Yeah. bringing together 
your voice and awesome music. And it's just such, uh, I, I, I highly recommend anybody watching or listening to this conversation, make time for that song line. Uh, you'll yes. Be glad. Thank you for mentioning it. It is my most uh, dear work with my now uh, gone partner colleague, Jerry Grinelli, one of the great jazz musicians in the world who died a year ago. But when you go to my homepage, it's right there. If you go to the bottom of the homepage, you can listen to samples. And um, it is a great way to encounter the difficulties, the reality of this time with music and just a full body mind spirit experience but then it also is a guide to how to develop your skills as a warrior so i highly recommend that as i do yes yeah well thank Megan. you michael yes thank <laughs> you dear sister thank you yeah